wildly as I can. Uh, so like I said, I'm David Grace from Sale Parks Recreation. Um, we are here tonight to talk about uh, Loman Beach uh, Seawall Shoreline Restoration Project. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming. Okay. Okay, go. So, thanks, David. So this is Spencer from our consultant team. We've hired uh, environmental science associates to do uh, the design work uh, for this project. So it'll be a combination of folks from ESA and myself doing the presentation tonight. Thanks, David. So we're, um, we're seeing if we can get the microphone working, but for, for now we'll do our best. Uh, so my name is Spencer Easton. I'm an environmental planner and a meeting facilitator with Environmental Science Associates. Um, and like David said, this is a meeting for the Loman Beach Shoreline Restoration Project. So the, the purpose of our meeting today is to provide you with an update on the, uh, the plans for Loman Beach Park. Um, we're going to talk about the design and about a bit about the process that got us to this point. And then we'll have time um, to answer your questions. So we've got an, an hour meeting. We started a few minutes late, so we'll go to about 7.35. Um, so I just talked about the purpose of the meeting. Um, but next, uh, David will give a summary of the project history. He'll talk a bit about what design alternatives were evaluated and the factors that influenced the design. And then um, Pablo Caroga and Sona Greenberg from ESA will talk more about, get into the details of the, the design. Um, and then they will talk about the benefits um, of the design. After that, we'll have question and answer. So we've got a great turnout today, which we really like to see. Um, but in order to give as many people as possible the opportunity to ask a question, when we get to question and answer, well, first we'll ask you to hold, hold questions till the end. Um, then when we get to question and answer, you know, ask a question, but try to keep it to one so that more people have a chance to ask a question. If you have more of a comment than, than a question, um, you know, try to keep it to just a minute or two. And those of us from the consultant team will, will be able to stay after the meeting ends. We'll be happy to answer more questions, um, talk with you more if you have more to say. So it's just about giving as many people as possible the chance to ask a question in the meeting. So with, uh, with that, I will hand things back over to David. So we have a microphone, so folks, uh, is that better for folks if I use a microphone? Yes. 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 Okay. How's that? Is that better? Wow. Okay. Um, so uh, this is just kind of a, a summary slide. So uh, in the 30s, uh, WPA project came in. They constructed a uh, tennis court, comfort station, and the original seawall. Um, 1950s, the, the north half of the seawall failed and was reconstructed. Uh, Mid-90s, 94, the south half of the seawall failed, and that was removed, and that was when the beach was created at the south half of the site. Um, the north section of the, of the seawall started to fail uh, 2015, November 2015, uh, during some storm events we had that year uh, in November. Um, it's tipped outward, and now the seawall is actually sliding down since I'm on top of a clay layer. So, um, that's where we are today. We're monitoring the seawall. Um, what we're seeing is it's not necessarily tipping over, but it's sliding. So that's kind of history of kind of where we are uh, today. Um, so 2017, uh, some folks might remember we were here, uh, not here, here, but here on West Seattle talking about, we did a feasibility study to look at, you know, what are the options for, um, for that seawall? and trying to get our arms around um, wind and waves and the coastal processes that are at work uh, in this site as well. We came up with three, we looked at three alternatives. One was a seawall replacement. One uh, was moving the seawall back to the edge of the tennis court and saving the tennis court. And the other option was removing the seawall and restoring the beach and removing the tennis court. <laughs> so the option we're moving forward with is removing the tennis court. And I know there's a bunch of tennis folks here. I, <laughs> I see all the tennis rackets, so we'll get to that. Um, so I, I appreciate that um, the tennis court's well-loved, well-used, and we're thinking about that. Um, so, uh, uh, so we're now at 30% uh, design, and design milestones are 30, 60, 90, and then 100% when the project goes out to bid for construction. Um, I have funding uh, to get us through to bid 
documents. I'm working on securing construction funding. Uh, some of it uh, will depend on some stuff in the legislature, uh, this year's state budget, and then a uh, future grant round as well for actual construction funding. Um, part of what we will be doing in this kind of move from 30% design to 60% design is some more detail on the coastal modeling. Now that we have a design, we'll start thinking about quantities of beach material that go down in that in the place of the seawall and try to understand um, once we put it down, once we place it, where does it all go? Does it stay at the beach? Does it migrate to the north? What's that look like and how long does that take? So that's the uh, coastal process evaluation. Also part of what we're doing uh, is looking at the park holistically, less associated with the restoration, but realizing that uh, this is a well-loved neighborhood park in West Seattle. We realize that the tennis court is also well-loved, so how do we how do we restore that tennis function uh, if, if it's not going back in the exact same spot, which you can't? Um, where can we restore that tennis function, uh, hopefully in the park someplace else? So, um, and we want to get everyone's feedback uh, tonight, we've done our internal review uh, within parks, uh, maintenance, and operations folks, uh, and there's some other folks looking at this project as well. We'll incorporate all that uh, as we move into the next design milestone, and then we'll come back out uh, to you all uh, with the next iteration of the design, which has more design detail. So, um, tonight's presentation will be up on our project website. Uh, maybe tomorrow, uh, more likely Monday. It's just a question of how long it takes me to get it up there. Um, please sign in in the back. Uh, my business cards are there as well, and um, my phone and email is also on the project website. So if folks have questions about the project, other comments, want to chat with me, I'm happy to chat. Send me, Give me a call, send me an email. I'm happy to talk about the project. So. so and, Sometimes I get ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> so these were the, like I said, these are the three alternatives we looked at in the feasibility study. Alternative three was uh, replacing the wall. Alternative two is the one we're moving forward with, <coughs> although it looks significantly different than that alternative. And then alternative one had a seawall at the edge of, of the tennis court. So um, in reviewing and looking at those options, um, these are the factors uh, that we looked at. Um, in, in making that decision to move forward with that option. Um, you know, park experience, and trying to think about what will this park be like when we're done? I mean, one thing uh, to get in mind, there's a really unique opportunity here that doesn't exist anyplace else in West Seattle. When this work is done, you'll be able to put a blanket on the lawn and watch your kids play in the sand and there won't be a bulkhead between the two. You'll be able to walk right from lawn to beach. You know, you think about Lincoln Park, there's a roadway, there's a bulkhead, and then there's beach. Alki, there's a road, there's parking, there's sidewalk, bulkhead, sand. So this is a really unique place for that kind of park experience that doesn't exist anyplace else. Um, there's some significant habitat benefits. Seawalls are uh, bad for juvenile salmon. So, and, and let me uh, caveat that with, I'm not a fish biologist, so, and, and I do have a fish biologist here. We'll talk more about the benefits of that later, so, um, but what they tell me is, and what uh, the Corps has run into problems with before when approving these sorts of things is the, is the wave energy and the space in front of, the, of, a, of a concrete bulkhead is not good for juvenile salmon. Juvenile salmon spend a fair amount of time in the near shore. They move up and down along these seawalls. 92% of the shoreline from the Duwamish on down to Burien is hardened bulkhead. So there's very few opportunities for those bulkheads to be removed to create a more natural beach. And this is one of those few places. Uh, sustainability. So you think about seawalls. Seawalls are vulnerable in big storm events and they're vulnerable to sea level rise. A natural beach is, is much more resilient to movement of wind and waves and, and sea level rise. Wave energy is dissipated on a shallow sloping beach. Um, wave energy is not dissipated uh, when it runs into a large uh, vertical concrete seawall. Coastal processes, we're looking at wind and waves and longshore drift, which is how does sediment move up and down the beach? Um, think about uh, Discovery Park, 
Discovery Park is one of the few places in Seattle that actually has feeder bluffs. And what that means is as that sand and gravel sloughs off the bluff, it moves up and down and, and keeps that beach in place that's there that what you, that's what you see out at West Point. So that's one of those few places that there is those feeder bluffs. With our project, we have an opportunity to add additional material that helps jumpstart that coastal process and actually add material to benefit uh, both the beach in front of our property and increase habitat opportunities. Uh, likely north, the net drift is to the north. Um, aesthetics, I talked a little bit about that. I mean, it's a, it'll be a, a beach, so, you know, with, with lawn and places for sitting, so it, it's, it's a unique park experience in the neighborhood. Uh, recreation, you know, launch a kayak, launch a stand-up paddleboard, uh, it's all, it, it, which a lot of that happens right now, but as far as access to the water, it's much easier with a gently sloping beach. Uh, permittability, I had a long, long conversations with research agencies, Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, Muckleshoot and Suquamish tribes as far as regulations. Could we rebuild the seawall? Would it be permittable? Uh, Fish and Wildlife grudgingly said yes because of existing structure, but they would push us long and hard as what is that seawall holding up? And what and what their concerns is, and I know I've talked to some of the neighbors, what their concern is, what's behind the seawall? So think much different than uh, Emma Schmitz to the north in Alki. There's a four, four and a half foot force main sewer line that takes all the sewage from this area and moves it north to the West Point treatment plant. That sewer line is a foot and a half behind, behind the Emma Schmidt seawall, which is why that seawall is being replaced, because that seawall holds up what is considered critical infrastructure. There isn't that, there isn't anything like that behind the seawall at Loman Beach. Um, and then cost and feasibility. Um, as a restoration project, this is really attractive from granting agencies, Recreation and Conservation Office, Salmon Recovery Funding Board. Um, taking a step back, uh, the state of Washington is, is divided into 62 water resource inventory areas, RIAs, um, based, on the listing of, based on the listing of Chinook salmon under the Endangered Species Act. Those uh, RIAs are based on river systems. So we are in uh, Raya 9, it's the Green Duwamish system that comes out into Puget Sound. Uh, this site was identified as a, hap as a priority site for restoration opportunities in the, 19 in the 2005 Raya 9 plan. So that uh, puts that on a higher priority for uh, grant funding. So, um, so those are, that's kind of, we work through all of those uh, to get us to uh, where we are today, or that was where we were in the feasibility study and why we chose to move forward uh, with uh, the removal of the tennis court, uh, removal of the seawall, and creation of the beach. Obviously, um, as you'll see, you saw the boards in the back, the design has evolved significantly from what is, was shown in the original concept. Um, and with that, I'll, I'm going to turn it over to Pablo. Hello, my name is Pablo Quiroga. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm the lead engineer of this project. Uh, my credentials are uh, have a background. I'm a coastal engineer, have a background in engineering and oceanography, and I'm the lead engineer of this project. I'm going to uh, present some of the main features of the 30% uh, proposed design, and then uh, our landscape architect is going to talk more about the, the park in general and the new features on the design. Um, so we're doing three main things in this project, um, that is the removal of four, the removal of the, of the existing uh, failed seawall, and we will add in a new, uh, retain a uh, proposed uh, uh, new seawall that will um, protect the houses on the north. And we add in a new beach, um, we are, uh, with Beach Norseman, we, from the previous design, we now we have a, a wider beach and more material, really more material than before, and we are sending the beach farther to the Puget Sound, and will encompass with the rest of the existing beach. Then we will be um, opening the Pelly Creek that right now is going down in this area. We will redirect it to this place and open it and make a creek. And this feature will be an area where you have a, it's a steep slope, so we need to have a transitional area where the creek goes 
and then it goes down into more natural system. The idea of uh, the free central area is also um, as a recreational part. I grew up next to a, a creek, and I know that as a kid you can play, uh, spend a lot of time just playing around next to a creek. And it has some um, yeah, great features too uh, as a kid for, for that. Um, we are lowering down the grade on those here in this area, so you will be able to be standing next here, as David was mentioned, and be able to to see to the Puyat Sound and to the beach. And then one of the I was was to Sona will talk more about the park in general. Hi everyone, I'm Sona. I'm the landscape architect for this project. So I'll be talking a little bit about the park features that we have shown here. So. We decided we wanted to make sure that we didn't have any more impact to the trees that are the, the big three wise men over here. So the idea for this part of the path was to keep that existing footprint in place and simply add some gravel to it so we could still have the access we need. Um, once we get to this area over here, we were going to adjoin a path to the alley over here and then finally have it come to a terminus over at the beach. In terms of uh, planting, we have uh, shoreline trees around the node that's where the paths meet. Um, one idea we had for, at least in memory of the tennis court here, was to reuse some of the paving to have in spots to remember it, at least for this location. So you'll see little bits of remember when it was here. And we have it under the benches as well. Um, for planting, Right behind where you see the woody, uh, the woody distribution over here, we have uh, beach vegetation that goes into a little bit of riparian vegetation as we go up to the daylighted part of the creek. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Did you? Oh yeah. So we have we have a close up of the section. So what we're looking at here in terms of the experience is coming down from the top entrance that we have of the existing gravel trail that's now widened. And then when we come down here, we have the area with, that's now going to be grass alongside a creek, which as Pablo mentioned, is actually quite a nice experience. Um, we have an extension of a, the trail once it comes to that terminus that you saw one, one picture back um, that will go a little bit to the north that can take you across the creek and to the seawall itself, what's left of it. There's a little bit there at the end. And then further down, you get to the beach. So we have a couple rough draft views for you. So this is our beach view looking south. Um, so this is where Pelly Creek would actually come out and feed into the sound. Um, and then we would have this area right now that's to be discussed about whether we will be crossing over the creek with or without stones. Um, and this is also an, the locations of the repurposed and replaced benches. So this is a view straight up the creek from the beach looking right back up. So it looks foreshortened because you're looking straight up the creek. It's a little bit longer than that. But this would be the back end of the beach area. You'd be standing on the wood from this view pretty much looking back towards the crossing, and then up towards the pools, and then to the actual opening in the, from the pipe back to the daylight. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the great benefits of the existing of the new design, um, more specific the natural shoreline, that we'll talk more about it, uh, the habitat of um, fish biologists who's going to talk about um, park experience that David and Sona will talk more about it. Um, for the natural shoreline, I forgot to mention that one of the design elements we put into place was to make it make room for adaptation. So the new um, beach will be able to be more adaptable to changes on sea level rise and moving on the sediment or change of conditions. Next one. So we're doing um, for the shore protection design. As mentioned, as Dave was mentioning, you can go naturally to a hard structure. And we went to this one from experience and from other projects and, and working that one. Um, Harden the shoreline has his advantage, right? I mean, you can hold the line, you can protect homes, roads, and utilities and put in place. But at the end, it's a, 
it can be a um, temporary um, solution. They tend to um, beach loose over time, they have higher impacts on the shore, and it's a lot costly to adapt to, um, to changes on the sea level. And they can have uh, potentially catastrophic failure, as we see on our place and we see in other, in other locations. So just talking about more about adaptability and what it means and how it produces this is a schematic of how it actually happens. Um, and what we see in, in all over the world is that when you have a normal beach and the sea level increase, so the storms increase in that area, what you see is that the beach moves up and adapts to the new location. When you have a hardening uh, shoreline, uh, in the beginning you have the same. But with time, over time, what happens is that the beach gets steeper and you start losing the beach, and then the seawall starts to um, be more exposed to, to waves and can fail. Um, so mention something about um, nothing. Um, good. Then uh, Paul is going to talk about the um, benefits of the habitat. Hi there. I'm uh, Paul Schlanger, fisheries biologist with uh, ESA. Uh, the consultant team working on this. Just want to walk through the habitat benefits and why do we why do we care about areas like this? I think David really set it up well, describing the describing the project and the, the challenges that we have, trying to return to do all we can to recover Puget Sound Chinook salmon. Yet we've got a highly developed uh, shoreline in central Puget Sound, so there aren't really a lot of opportunities to remove uh, remove armoring. Um, but we, what we find out more and more, the more studies that are done on, on Chinook salmon, the more we seem to understand and learn about how these shallow water habitats along the marine shoreline are important for the survival of these fish. So intentionally picked a, a couple of photos here just to kind of highlight the top one, just kind of showing the beach out into the, out into the, um, or the, the wall out, in, out into the beach in the bottom. Uh, is a higher water and it's it's kind of up against the up against the seawall there. What that indicates, and kind of looking back to some of Pablo's slides, kind of the, the splashing of waves that can happen during during king tides, or as we, we kind of play it forward towards towards sea level rise. These having the wall out in this area basically truncates and it, it, it cuts off the beach, so we lose those upper beach habitats. And as I said, there's a lot. We're learning more and more about how important these areas are. Um, as uh, <clears throat> as I talk about this and the benefits, I'm going to focus on two main groups of species. One is is Chinook salmon, and again, they're uh, they're listed under uh, uh, Federal Endangered Species Act as protected. We put a lot of effort into restoring them. They're a main they're a main focus. And frankly, they're also a species that kind of haven't. Habitat restoration projects that have benefits for Chinook salmon in this, it, at this time are the ones that are getting funded. It's like that's making sure you're, the, the project on the shoreline improves conditions for, for uh, Chinook salmon can improve, it can uh, be more, can be eligible for, for habitat restoration funding. Um, and then I also want to talk about forage fish, uh, bait fish, uh, two beach spawning species that, that use the area. Um, Pacific Sandlands, the, the top, uh, and, and surf smelt on the bottom. So juvenile Chinook salmon uh, come out of the, uh, Chinook salmon rear or, or originate in the large rivers of the area. So uh, as David mentioned, closest is Green Duwamish to here. They, so they go out to sea and what we go out to the marine waters and rather than just a directed movement right out to the Pacific Ocean, these fish are actually staying along the shorelines and not just kind of near the shorelines, they like really shallow water, and they stay in the surface. And so as the tide is kind of going in and out, the fish are, are moving. They're kind of following that water line and, and staying close to it. It gives a, it gives great foraging opportunities with a lot of the, the invertebrates that are produced along the shoreline. As it gets in towards kind of the, the higher tide levels, you get a lot more like insect drop from uh, riparian vegetation along the shoreline. Uh, really important uh, prey species that prey groups that can increase um, the, the the rate of growth for, for juvenile salmon, uh, which is which can be really important really important for them, um, as, as well as um, in addition to, to feeding. Also, 
uh, smaller fish, uh, like the juvenile salmon are, can get into the shallower water, keeps them separated from potential predators, so we keep more alive, and that's, that's a good thing. And also have fish that are just moving, direct to movements right along the shoreline. This, the story with forage fish is, is really interesting. I just, I just think it's really cool. So we've got, we've got two species of, of forage fish, sandlands and surf smelt, that spawn in the intertidal zone. And so they deposit their eggs when the water's when the water's in. The eggs are they are stuck to kind of small material. You can see a penny there next to some sand. Um, they stay, and then as the water goes out, that the the eggs stay there, so they're out of the water, but they they don't dry out, depending on depending on the site, and they stay there and, and incubate over over two weeks. Occasionally inundated, occasionally underwater, and occasionally out. Um, these species. These fish spawn in the in the upper intertidal. So if the seawall's here, we're cutting off a lot of the a lot of the potential habitat for these for these species. Um, and this type of this type of restoration, removing the shoreline, arming, and re restoring that natural beach profile, provides the opportunity to provide the habitat that these these fish spawn in. Another word about about forage fish too is just their importance in kind of the centrally located in a, in a food web. The, the graphic is, is, is complicated. What I, wanna, what I wanna point out is the number of arrows. It's like forage fish in the big box in the middle are linked to the, the prey resources of, 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 um, of numerous species uh, in, in the food web, all the way up to, to whales, seals, and, and eagles. WDFW maintains a database to kind of show where um, Forage fish spawning has been documented. In this case, um, hopefully you can see the call out. Loman Beach is there. Um, this green line is where surf smelt have been documented along Lincoln Park. Um, they have not been documented along Loman Beach Park, but this is the type of project where it will provide the type of habitat that will be suitable for them uh, to, to spawn in the future. Um, so it's nice to see that there's some there's forage fish spawning already or they're coming to this area already. And it would be um, it could be a, a nice opportunity to increase the potential spawning habitat for them. Uh, just kind of last slide. I like this one. It just just kind of points out the the connections and the linkages. So kind of focused on juvenile salmon, focused on forage fish, but it's all it's all connected. So everything about the beach processes and kind of how the upper intertidal beach functions it provides benefits not only for for the salmon and the forage fish, but all the way up to uh, to the orca whale, which have been in the news a lot. So the, these are the types of habitat or types of restoration projects that we're trying to do with an eye towards juvenile salmon, orca salmon, and the entire near shore community and the benefits that can provide. So I just, I, I just want to leave this graphic up, and it's the same graphics that are back there. It's, it's back to the um, kind of the overall uh, park design. Um, like I said, we're at 30%. We're thinking uh, through some issues out there. We're also, uh, to uh, folks in the room with tennis rackets, um, <laughs> we're looking at um, sort of this area of the park as an opportunity to restore that, that tennis function. So um, really, we haven't forgot about you. Um, and so as we, as we move through to the next uh, design iteration, that'll uh, come much more into focus. But that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at. Um, and with that, I was going to, I'll open it up to questions, but, um, and my contact info is here, but uh, let me go back just to the overall uh, design slide, and, um, and uh, we can, between uh, myself and uh, my design team, we're happy to, to take questions um, from folks. Uh, here and then there. What sort of evidence do you have that any baby salmon are living in the south end that we took out in 1980? Uh, so this this site was one of the reference sites that uh, Jason Toft uh, and uh, Jeff Cordell used for uh, when they did um, monitoring along the seawall. So. Um, and when you do uh, fish monitoring, so fish are mobile. So um, I could go out there tomorrow and look for juvenile salmon and not see any. It doesn't uh, mean 
that they're not there. They could have been there yesterday, they could be there tomorrow, they could be there the day after. What they look for is the benthic organisms, the prey that they eat, and, um, and that is an indication if there is uh, benthic organisms, things that juvenile salmon would eat, then that's a likely spot where you would see those juveniles. And so what they did find at the restored beach is they did find those benthic organisms that would be food for salmon. So the fact that you go out and do a snorkel survey and there's no juvenile salmon that day when you're out there doesn't mean there isn't the presence of fish. The, they use the benthic organ. The organism as an indicator that there would be habitat for, for juveniles. Yes, sir. Now, um, I'm particularly excited about the, the daylighting of the stream. Um, and it looks a little perfunctory to me. It comes out and goes, goes down, down the beach, which is great. But I was wondering, especially since uh, oh. Pablo mentioned that you're dealing with a steep slope where it first comes out. And so you have the rockeries and the pools, which is a nice feature. But I'm wondering if, about if, if it angles, if, if you turn it south and have it meander, almost traversing down the slope and having it meet the, the beach further south. Yeah. Roughly, I'm, I'm imagining something like that. Yeah. Uh, just a suggestion, it gives you more, more of a stream. And uh, also, I wonder why why it comes out that far down, why not closer up toward the, toward the street, but that might be just where, where it ever is from the ground. Well, the problem with going around is that you have to modify more of the grading of the other side, and you will lose some of the park. Um, Could you speak yeah. up, please? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh. I repeat the question. So he's asking about why we don't increase the, the creek and make it um, going more around and around this area and, and you know increase the, the size of the area. Um, we, I mean, it's something we could do, but then that will make the design a lot more complicated and will ask will require for us to also down uh, make this area lower. And just to um, I have a backup slide just for that one where we look at um, the section of the pools. Um, well, this is. Uh, the, the Pelly Creek pipe and how it opens and when we have these pools that drops down and deal with that steep slope. Um, but yeah, we try to um, maximize the extension of the river, but at the end it's a, a mix between having an area where you, um, you, know, you deal with the, sl the slope and then you deal with the, the grading of the area. Well, if, uh, if it, as the de design develops, um, and there's an opportunity to meander the street. Yeah. I hope you'll consider it. Yeah, yeah, definitely will do that. Yeah. And I'm sure you get this question every time, but I, I love the daylight idea. I live upstream uh, from here on Pelly Creek. Um, any chance of salmon? I mean, coming back up? That's um, it's, I mean, I know it's short and it's small, but just yeah. hoping. It's, there's, not, there's only about anywhere from, sorry. There's only about two to five CFS, two oh, feet yeah. per second, and so there's not a ton of flow. Um, what you'll see is salmon, juveniles taking advantage of the fresh water and the organisms there, but there isn't enough to support a run of salmon. You need 10, 15, 20, I mean, you need a much more significant flow and for longer. Yeah, it's, for this to be a kind of a salmon stream, it needs to be bigger. It's just, it's way too small. Um, it's, yeah, won't, won't sustain salmon, but they'll nose in as, as juveniles potentially in the, in the right conditions, depending. Um, but as, as David touched on, the, the prey production is, is real, and the opportunity of a daylighted creek to kind of produce prey items, that's, that's where there's some real, real benefits there. Yeah. So. Um, and your first slide, you had different reasons for opening up the park, bringing in different people. And one of the things that you, so when you redo this, you're going to have a lot more people coming down. And again, there's no toilet. And I'm really <laughs> concerned about down. no toilet and having, we have hundreds of people over a weekend down there. And you're talking about in picnicking and bringing your family. And it's not enjoyable when little kids say, I have to go potty. So, and then they get sent down on the beach to poop on the beach. And then you're defeating the purpose of what we're doing. So, 
and many of us believe that that's happening because the wall is gone and the sediment has been stolen by the open beach and is now taking it from the beach areas where those walls are. And therefore, those walls are going to have a very detrimental effect. If you take out even more wall, there's going to be even more sediment drift in the wrong direction, causing damage to these seawalls. So that's a lot of stuff. Let me try and uh, unpack that. I know we've had this conversation, and we can continue to have that conversation. Um, so uh, one of the things we're going to do, um, one of the things this project gives us an opportunity to do, <coughs> I mean, remember, think about um, Discovery Park. So there's no feeder bluffs in this area. There used to be, but there aren't any more. So there's no new okay. material coming into the system. The only material that's in the system is what's been placed there. So the Corps did a fair amount of beach uh, re-nourishment work back early 2000s uh, at Lincoln Park. So it's likely that the, a lot of the material that the Corps has placed ended up at our site. The net longshore drift is to the north, which is why that stuff ended up at the south end of our park. We have an opportunity as part of our work to add material on our beach that will then get redistributed in this area. So that's one of the modeling pieces we're going to look at is if we, if we add this material, what's that look like? Where does it go? How long does it take it to get there? So we are cognizant of our concerns of the neighbors to the north. We want to be good neighbors. So that is something we'll be looking at as we move from 30 to 60 percent design. We'll be doing some modeling. We're happy to share all that information with folks to the extent they want to see it. So. Uh, Yes, sir, you and that, and then I'll go there and there. <coughs> the area you said you're going to, there is a flat area that you're going to put a tennis court there. Is there a possibility to have two, or uh, I think I've seen it in the city of Redmond, they have like a half a court that you could practice. Mm -hmm. So could, could there be some sort of arrangement like that? So let me just, oops, sorry. Um, so, one, I'm not making any promises on the tennis court, but that's the, that's the likely spot that it's flat where it could go. And we have to figure, look at the size. I'm, I don't know that it's, you know. So if that's the tennis court, and nice pen is, small, is smaller than the tennis court, could you get one up there? Likely, I don't know that you'd get any more than one, assuming you could even get one up there. But that's something we're going to look at as we move to the next iteration of design. Because, okay, if you could have a, that uh, half court for practicing, I think you get more people, because it's very unique, so you get more people going there to use it. So that's, I hope you keep that in mind. We will keep that in mind. Uh, Are you saying one and a half or just a half? Uh, one and a half. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Swing back to the blue. Brad, you have a question? Yeah. yeah um, so two related ones. In terms of bringing in more material, I mean, would that be an ongoing process and as opposed to one time? And the reason I ask is, I mean, this is a beautiful design, but how likely is it to look anything like this 10 years from now? And that I've been involved with lots of projects on the East Coast, West Coast, and they bring in great modeling, and it never goes as modeled. And you laugh. But, but, no, but you're but, right. You're right. But that's one of the concerns, right? Will yeah. it be completely eaten away? Will it be a large finger that blocks sediment all the way to the coast? And I, I just don't know what's being thought of in terms of potential implications when you can't model well. Yeah, and, and I, I don't mean you to be personal here. I don't mean you personally, but I think as a field. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair point. Uh, and, uh, you know, we will do our best. I mean, we have a pretty good handle on what the wind and wave and longshore drift is in this area. You know, we've seen kind of how, if you look at aerial photos, you see, we've seen how this beach has expanded over time. Um, so, uh, you know, we have some good evidence. You're right, the models aren't perfect. You get a 100-year storm, 200-year storm, things go completely awry. So, uh, I mean, we will do our best to model this, and we'll use our best science and our best brains to do the best we can. And if, you know, 10 years from now, we get some giant storm when the beach blows out, then we'll revisit. We'll have to revisit this the same way we revisit other beaches that have eroded. And that's, I mean, that's, 
that's the reality of these you know, created shorelines. We do our best to make them as resilient as possible, but nature happens, and that's, I mean, that's the reality of it. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. So when you do this modeling, so the, the only modeling I'm familiar with is Monte Carlo modeling. So you do, you know, 10,000 scenarios, and you, you come up with a curve, and it says, okay, well, with this gravel, it's going to do the best. And, and so when you, when you go to the 90% design, and you're picking the amount of material and the size of the gravel and all that, is the budget linked to this same decision sequence <coughs> so that you're, so that you're on 1% or your, what do you call it, a 100 year storm comes in and you find out that's such a small percent likelihood, but is there some budget for contingencies? Yes, I mean, every, every budget has a built-in <coughs> contingency. Um, and, I mean, you think about this project, and probably the cheapest component is the sand. I mean, sand's rel sand and gravel is relatively cheap. Is it, you know, is it 100 cubic yards, 200 yards? It, it, so, but yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. We have, we have budget numbers at 30% design with a 30% contingency in it. And so as we move forward in the design, move forward in our bottling, we'll keep those contingencies in there as we move forward to address those sorts of questions. I guess I'm, I, what I'm trying to get at is the five and 10 year plan, like was mentioned earlier. I mean, that's a, you know, that's a different piece. I mean, that's a different, I mean, that's a different pot of money then. I and mean, we have, we have a project okay. budget. We have a project budget now. If 10 years from now something happens here, then that's got to come from a different source. And that would that be within parks? Yeah, it have to come from. It have to come up. What we'd have to do, and this happens not all the time, but emergencies happen. Water lines, roofs, those all those things. As you all know, with your own homes, something unexpected happens, and you reprioritize your budgets. And that's that's just the reality of what we all go through. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Before you do any heavy lifting on the tennis court, um, I had a problem with the questionnaire that was given by the Parks Board uh, about this project uh, and replacement. And uh, one of the most frequent questions was why the, uh, the choice for the answer never use the tennis court. Would like to see the tennis court removed. Why that wasn't one of the choices? Because I think. This room has all the tennis court people I've ever seen ever <laughs> at Little Beach. So I just want to point that out that, you know, that's a flaw in your questionnaire. I'm here because I don't want to see the tennis court there. I never, I maybe see one or two people there. I think there's the best, the better use for that space. There's a, you know, some, there's one over there at uh, the, um, right on the other side. Solstice Park. Thank you. Seattle, and I don't know of any new tennis courts. 
So it's getting harder and harder to find tennis courts, and I just don't think we can afford to lose a, a court. I appreciate that. There's a lot of people in this group that live near the tennis court, and we can attest to the fact that people do use that tennis court. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, to the lady back there, I've lived in the neighborhood for over 50 years. That tennis court is beloved, and yeah. it has fallen into disrepair, yeah. and that's, people that's, still that's come it, down to play it. there. So, and so that's so the truth. If you can, if you yeah. can direct I, I just wondered, to you know, I know we're in the planning process. Do you have a breakdown of the cost <laughs> involved with all the, with all the different options? Because I haven't seen you pull that up for people, like what the costs are. And, and the other comment I just wanted to make is, um, you know, like with the creosote logs that just recently got pulled out of, out of Lincoln Park, and I, I don't walk on the beach very often, but I know I, I walk down, I, I walk at the park like every day, and I've only seen like one nesting pair of, of ducks down there in the whole five years that I walk down there every day, which is frightening. And I wonder if we're, we're all excited, you know, everybody wants to save the salmon, and I want to save the salmon, we all do, but I wonder, you know, if some of the park's money should be more used, and we should really start going for the super fun. Uh, site money and trying to improve our, I guess, our water quality. I, I go down to Lincoln Park now the last few days and I, I, it's just like I still smell the creosote in my in my nostrils and wasn't really, there was no signs put up that the, you guys, they were going to chop that up down there and I saw that the people that were doing that work, were, were, they didn't, they had dust masks on, they didn't have any kind of respirators or anything to protect them from uh, potential, I guess that would be like nerve damage and stuff and I kind of want to call uh, I guess my representatives and stuff, I, and, and just say, what, what are we doing with some of those? They were fairly young kids that were doing a lot of the work, and I was sad wow. about that. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I just want to, before we run out of time, I just want to make a, a comment. I don't really have a question at this point. So uh, this is really a unique opportunity to restore Loman Beach Park, right? So we can... We're uncovering the creek, we're restoring the beach, getting rid of the seawall, all those, all those good things. But I hope you take into consideration as part of that, the usability of the park, including, you know, not losing the tennis court. I really hate to see a restoration take things away. So we need to restore the tennis court, relocate that. We need restrooms, we need, right. need benches, a picnic table there. You know, that tennis court's been there since 1932, and we don't want to lose it. And the gentleman was 100% right. If, if there's any reason people don't use it, it's because there hasn't been any maintenance on that yeah. since 1950-something, probably. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So that's my statement, is, is make sure that we're, we're taking this opportunity to really make this a nice park and not cutting any corners, like not putting in bathrooms and benches. Uh, Lisa, and then you. Yeah, and then can we acknowledge that the reason people don't use this part as much as the others is because of its condition? And we would also like to say, can we discuss the fact that the neighborhood matching fund from, fund from the city of Seattle would be interested in talking to us about the cost of putting the court closer to the sidewalk away from the trees? So. Um, their next deadline is June 4th for the neighborhood matching fund. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to compliment you all. You've done a tremendous job. I'm very attached to the tennis court, too. My daughter learned to walk on it. Uh, her little friend, we live up the street from Loman Beach, so I often took care of her and her friends, and we drag their bikes down and they rode bikes on it. And I'm not, I'm not very uh, coordinated, so I don't play tennis. But I still love that tennis court, so um, I was feeling very nostalgic. But I, I think that, um, that the way you have presented this is uh, very convincing. And, um, and I want to continue to think about it and, and hear where you're at when you're at 60% of the process. And I did walk in 10 minutes late, so could you briefly tell us what the timeline is again? If sure. You okay. Sure. So um, we'll be at 60% uh, mid-April-ish, so we'll figure out uh, then, you know, 
whether we'll do another public meeting like this or, you know, maybe it'll be nice enough when you actually meet out at the park. So, uh, but it'll be kind of April-ish time frame for, uh, for the next kind of design milestone. Um, at 60%, I'll also start submitting for permits, Fish and Wildlife Corps of Engineers, uh, SEPA process, uh, Seattle Department of Construction Inspections, showing substantial development permits, so that process will move forward. Um, we'd like to be at 100% design and have bid docs ready, bid documents to go out to construction by the end of the year. Um, assuming I have construction dollars lined up, we would do construction in 2020. So that's 2020. Kind of and how long will the construct, what's the estimated time that the construction will take? Three months, six months, three months? Oh, three months. That's, that's better than the CSO facility. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel bad for y'all folks because you lived through how many years of, of bang, CSO bang, construction. Bang, so bang, I, yeah. that's in our mind as well. Uh, yes, Anna, back. Yeah, I just want to make a quick statement on the neighbor here too. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about my niece and nephew and their future kids. And I'm thinking about when they'll ask me what I did to make choices that made sure that when they go to the beach, they can see orca whale. And when they go to their rivers, they can see salmon. And then they know that the habitat that we've preserved for them is going to work for them. Instead of saying, I didn't make a hard choice. I chose a, a tennis court. I chose a facility. Um, instead of this system that they're going to depend on. So I'm sorry I'm getting a little emotional about it. But um, I don't want to steal a future from my children's children and my niece and nephew. Um, I'll just leave it there. We could have both. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sarah in the back. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, an, I'm a tennis player and been in the community for 20 some years. I'm a tennis coach too. And just to respond to the argument about we have other courts to, to play at. I'd just like to point out that the, the condition of our other courts is quite poor. The solstice parks have lots of cracks and grass growing in them. The chief self courts always have pebbles in them. I have to go up there and sweep the pebbles myself. They've never had six net straps. It seems like the quality of the courts that we've been given or they're not being cared for. So if we have the opportunity to have one court, a new court built in the area that's done right, it's just an exciting um, potential for tennis community, and I guarantee if we have a nice court down there, it's going to be the most popular court in West Seattle. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am, and then red and blue. Uh, so, I have three little things to say. One is that I really like the design and the beach idea, so thank you. It's, it's, it's very exciting. The second question is, um, just because maybe I'm behind on the news, what's happening with the swing set that's there now and any other children's play stuff? And the third comment is, um, you talk, I thought I heard that the statement of gravel paths, which is great and fine for a natural concept. If we want to make it more accessible for more people, might there also be some access to the park that is a park service? So, thank you. Um, the, the swing set will stay. That was, well, there was originally a swing set there, constructed in the 30s. That swing set is relatively new. But, you know, we're thinking about is there, is there an opportunity for just more than just a swing set? So there's that piece. Um, the other piece is accessibility and how we get uh, folks who are less able uh, to and from the beach. So that's another piece that's in our mind. Um, gravel can be made accessible. We do it in a lot of places. We use gravel and put a binder in it. So it's a, a, a lot firmer. So if you're getting folks with a chair or they have some mobility challenges, it's a little bit easier for them to navigate. So that's part of all our work uh, at parks is to try to make things as accessible for all ages and all abilities and make them as accessible as we can. So, uh, yes, sir, in the back, and then I'll go here and yeah. Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, with projects like these, there's always trade-offs and there's different stakeholders that have different interests in the outcome. But, but honestly, if you were able to um, relocate the tennis court up into that flat space there, you have kind of a, a fairly rare opportunity to to, you know, have a win-win for, you know, both tennis and for salmon restoration and habitat. So I really would strongly encourage you to take a deep dive into that area, take a look at it, because you can, you can, uh, you can do both. You can accomplish both, and everybody here can walk out of this room and feel like, hey, you know, the city's really making an effort here to, 
to, to listen to um, the various audiences that are interested in this space. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm looking down the road about when you're at 80%. But I find the fisheries um, comment about the um, the um, surf smelled and that other, if there was some kind of a sign that was an educational sign that said what floats out here in the water and what uh, more about the habitat, you see it in a lot of sure. natural yep. uh, parks. Yep. Uh, yes, sir, in the red and back, and then I'll go to you. It seems that what you said your schedule is that design is already made because in order to make those dates it's very hard to see that there's a lot of different options that can be done so it seems similar to when we first had these meetings and we said there was options it seems like there was no options it, was a it appears that there was a decision on which direction to go and I remember asking the question almost a year ago whether or not there was a mandate to date to basically unarm the beach and to me it seems like there is a movement you're going forward with and that you're telling us that perhaps the tennis courts can get moved. But in reality, you need to make these dates and you're trying to get a construction done and you're getting matching grants or something else. Is You have fairly hard times to meet it without the ability to say, try all these other options. So I don't know if we just sit in this room and we hear all this stuff and it is a waste of our time if you are always, if you already have a mandate or a design that you need to meet, and you're planning on meeting, so uh, that's a that's a fair question because the restoration work is funded through design, and I'm seeking grant funding for the construction of that that tennis piece. Whether you know constructing it in the southeast corner, that's not part of my grants. That's that's not that's not part of this project. That's not what the Salmon Recovery Funding Board is granting us dollars for. That said, that piece can move separately. That doesn't need to be part of this project. So I think there's, there's an opportunity for us to, to, to work on this restoration piece at the same time as we look at what are our options for tennis and move that forward with a different funding stream at whatever time frame that warrants. So they're not mutually exclusive. Well, well, I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, as neighbors brought up the, pack, the fact that the impact that the beach buildup at that point had on the bulkheads to the north, and that some of the beaches have dropped two and three feet over a very short period of time. That was brought up a year and a half ago. And so to say that you're gonna go straight ahead and do this, without studying the impact of the neighbors, especially when you have a neighbor right next door and you're taking the bulkhead down to this, is, is that you have an adverse impact with people that are paying horrendous taxes and also live in the neighborhood and also want the salmon to be, uh, the salmon habitat enhanced, et cetera. But it seems like there's a lot of different pieces here and that the design is being driven regardless of the impacts, both what happens on the beach, what happens with the tennis courts, and what happens with this park, because we've gone through meetings before, and little by little, the park I've seen disappear over the 25 years I've lived in the neighborhood, in terms of having this an industrial site rather than a park. And this is, it seems that even though we hear this stuff and they tell us options, in reality, it seems like there's a decision made behind, regardless of what we say. Yeah. But Tom, I, and I, I'll, I'll just restate this again. Part of what we are doing for, remember, these are target dates. They're not set in stone. Um, is part of what we're doing as we move from 30 to 60 is doing that modeling so we understand what what we what we can accomplish with our beach material and what will that impact be what will that look like where does it go how much do we place where does it go how long does it take so there is a fair amount of consideration that is being placed on on our neighbors concerns that have been raised by our neighbors to the north but that was not even brought up at the first when we first started talking about there was no in, there was no comment it was like it was news to the design team and so that was a year and a half ago a design team which appears already wanted to take the wall down and there was no awareness of it until neighbors started saying hey wait a second our walls are collapsing because of this and in 25 years i certainly seen the build the beach build up tremendously at that spot so i, I want to hear from a couple of folks and 
I'm happy to chat later. I mean, we we are talking to the neighbors to the north, and we are working through this. So it's I, that's a fair point, and that is something we consider very. Yeah. 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 I just want to say I came here today because I'm really in the salmon habitat restoration camp and it was really wonderful to hear from the recreation people and I love the idea of a win-win and the person who thinks they might be able to leverage some neighborhood matching funds is a great idea and so I challenge the local team of folks to get involved and bring some value to this project with what you care about. And having a project that can offer outdoor recreation activities for children and salmon benefits is a real win-win. So the idea of phasing it as phase two with the tennis court, if you need a little more time to work it out with the county, is a great idea. And then to, to piggyback on the sign idea, there's a lot of people who have bulkheads on Puget Sound that do not understand the impacts that they're making and the fact that if this park was here or not, bulkheads fail over time. They're not a sustainable infrastructure. So you can put some signs in as well to help educate people about soft shoreline treatments that actually are more sustainable and better for homeowners. So there's a lot of ignorance or there's a lot of new science that people don't know about that this project could address. So it could be like four wins. And I, I commend you, David, for this dialogue. <laughs> so, it, it, thank you. Uh, so it's almost uh, 7.45, and I want to be respectful of folks' time. I'll take a couple more questions. You know, design team's here. I'm having to chat with folks. Um, so anyone who hasn't had an opportunity to... to I, I just, um, would, it, would it be feasible at all if they want a restroom to put it in that sewer thing across the street? That, I mean, that's a great question for King County. We don't, I don't, we sell parks and recreation, don't own it, so. The that was brought up to them, and they said they didn't want to maintain it. Yeah. They didn't want the public there. Any, any, any last questions before I, uh, I, one, I also, I really do appreciate y'all taking time out of your day, evening, uh, to come and, and uh, to talk to us and hear from you, and, and know that, um, Actually, you did write your comments down and scribble. Um, and uh, and we do value uh, everyone's input. And you know, we we will endeavor to make everyone happy. I'm sure we won't. But uh, you know, if nothing else, I hope the process is transparent. So again, uh, thank you all for coming. Um,